Shalom, everybody, and good evening. For you that's out there on media land, we ask that you just pay attention to what God has for us this evening with our teaching on the Dr. Daniel Vargas this evening. Amen. For all you that's here, bless you. Shalom. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Father, Adonai, we come before you in Yeshua's mighty name. We just give you all the glory and honor that we are, God, available for you to hear what you have for us, God. So, Lord, we thank you for the opportunity that we have to sit at your table this evening, God, under the anointed teaching of our teacher this evening. We just ask for your, that you would have your mighty way, God, in our service this evening. We give you glory and honor. We thank you in Yeshua's mighty name, and we all say Amen. Amen. God bless you, Dr. Daniel Vargas. Shalom. Shalom. Hallelujah. Hasn't the Lord been good to us? Hallelujah. Well, once again, we are here to learn from his word. Heaven and earth is going to pass away, but his word will remain and uh, forever and it's his word that heals us and puts us in the right direction amen and tonight in tonight's study in in torah we're going to be looking at um, the subject of the the one new man it's a really important subject i want to bring some clarity into this area and um, move it so that we can move forward in in the ways of the Lord and what he has planned and why this topic is so really important for us. Uh, if there's going to be a one new man, uh, that means there are not going to be a two, but one, you know. And if there's only one, that means there's not only just one word, but uh, there's one mind, one spirit, you know, one song, not uh, two, not 20, not a hundred. Yeah, so that's why I think this subject is uh, relevant to, to us, especially those that are learning Torah these days. So I'm going to start with uh, in the New Covenant, in Bereshit, uh, Ephesians chapter 2, where in verse 14 it says, For he himself is our shalom, our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh. The dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinance that he might create in himself one new man in place of what two yeah so making peace or shalom and uh, Therefore, if he's able to succeed in making one out of two, there will be peace. There will be this division among um, the factions of what's messianic and Christians. We, we're different. We'll find out t not tonight that we're really not that different. So it says, therefore, in making peace and might reconcile us both, both, to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility, removing the hostility, okay? Since uh, we know that both Paul and Yeshua are Messiah, they both in harmony and in scripture, they attest that Yeshua did not come to abolish the law. Okay, so we need to clarify and be able to know what it means when it says there that um, the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments because that scripture is always used to say that the law was abolished and the commandments are not relevant. And so we need to have some inside information to be able to share with others. So as we're learning tonight here or over there in live stream, please take down some 
notes that seem to hit home into what, here again, both Paul and Yeshua attest that he did not abolish the law. So that in fact that the Torah is, if he did not abolish it, it is an ongoing validity. It just needs to know, we need to know how to interpret correctly the laws of God. And that's why Yeshua came. He came to correctly interpret the law. Not only the law of God, but correctly interpret it versus the laws that men were adding to the laws of God. Okay? So that's why in Ephesians 2.15, we, we, we begin to understand that this actually, it is saying that the law was, uh, it was abolished, but it was not abolished. So what was abolished? Well, there's a law, and I want you to write this down, a law that is called derab, derab banam, banan, derab banan, D-R-A-B, B-A-N-A-N, or it is <clears throat> of the rabbi. So, so there's a law that is of the rabbis. It's not the law of God. And these laws uh, that were legislated by the rabbis are also considered um, by the rabbis to be obligatory by observing Jews. In other words, they tell the Jews, listen, you have to observe these. Mm -hmm. So they added to these laws. Now, re other religions do that. The Catholic Church added a lot of laws. If you want to come out of... Uh, uh, what do they call it? Um, you know, purgatory. Well, listen. There's we have a law. Is that you, they're going to stay there until you pay us some money. You know. So, you know, religions add laws in order to benefit, but these are not laws of God. But when the rabbis were adding laws, they were making it obligatory. Well, God says, don't work on the Sabbath. And you can only walk 50 feet, and you got to have a chair and sit down. And, and you go to Israel, under the Sabbath, you, you, can't, you can't press the elevator to go up. There's an elevator that goes up by itself. You just get into that elevator. And when you get home, you don't light your house up. You have other means that you've already attended to, and you don't cook. You see all these laws that are being added? So that's the laws he's talking about. He came to abolish those laws because those laws were not of God. Just think, he, he, he gave the laws to Moses and those uh, laws uh, are laws uh, to help us to know how to live by. Just like a street light is important, right? So that cars don't crash and kill each other. So the laws that God has given to us is to maintain um, harmony and order and no chaos. And if you follow these laws of God, there's going to be lots of blessings. So what was abolished? This law, these laws, the, the de Rabban, Banan laws or the laws of the rabbis. These are laws legislated by the rabbis, considered obligatory by, by the observant Jews. So rabbis, like priests in the Catholic Church, they have long been adding and adding their own laws and interpretations uh, to the Torah, and there is um, no one answer to how many of these laws have been added. I mean, we could only figure out maybe there's a hundred laws, two hundred laws, a thousand laws that have been added. We don't know how many laws, but rabbis like priests, they've done this over the ages, added their own laws, interpretations through the Torah, and, and uh, folks, I want us just to think about there's other laws that they're trying to add in our nation. Um, it starts out with you can no longer call a boy a boy. You don't call her a girl. Don't call her a mom. Don't call him a dad. 
Just think if later on they actually made these into laws and, and 50 years from now, uh, what? What's a boy? You, you said boy? We never heard of boy. You see how, how laws can affect a, a person? Some rabbis have added hundreds of laws while others have only added a few. The numbers of laws that the rabbis add to the Torah is usually based on their very own interpretation. Interpretation of the text. But they say we're not adding or taking away. They're just saying that these are important rules that will help you. Ordinance, yes indeed. But we look at the word of God, and the Torah especially, and we find that there's nothing inherent in the Torah itself that would even come close to maybe considering that there's something there that caused hostility. Not the word of God didn't cause any hostility between Jews and Gentiles. It's these other additional laws. Mm hmm Therefore, it is speaking about laws and ordinance made by man. Not, it doesn't mean that God has abolished the laws that he gave to Moses. Ephesians again 2.15 uses the metaphor, one new what? One new man. It refers <clears throat> really not just to one, one person, but it refers to all who have been reconciled to God. Through Messiah Yeshua. Meaning that now we all can think the same way. We have the same mindset. <clears throat> the unequivocal conclusion of this one man, one new man, is that one new man in Ephesians 2.15 refers to the, the composite unity of Jews and Gentiles. So there's Jews and Gentiles, and they've been brought together, a, a composite unity of Jews and Gentiles, but, but they retain their ethnic, their ethnicity. They retain their identity, even after spiritual regeneration through Messiah. It's like um, you adopt someone from another ethnic, He's adopted, he's part family, but he, re he retains what? His own ethnic. Mm -hmm. That's really important because we need to let Christians worship God in the way that they feel like they need to worship God. They're, they're, they were Gentiles, but now they're Christians. They are serving God in their own ethnicity as well. Their own mannerism. You go to different cultures that worship God in, in so many different ways. And, and that is good. But we can learn from each other too, right? <clears throat> so it's, um, that's what it really means by this uh, one new man. Now some or many, could be many, many believers, Christians, they assume that there's some kind of dullness or there's two different kinds of teachings <clears throat> between what the, the Messianic Jews are teaching and the, the Christians teach. Well, I, I would like to say that it is not so. Messianic teachings and Jewish teachings are really not different. And I'll explain the, re the reason why. It is not because we have, um, we have different teachings, not because we have different teachings, folks, but because there are <clears throat> Jewish ways of viewing the scriptures versus uh, the Christian way of understanding scripture. So if we're viewing scriptures from, from this way, um, then <clears throat> it doesn't mean that it, it's a different teaching. It's like a diamond. 
You can view a diamond as still a diamond from different angles, has different colors, and each one is beautiful. Mm -hmm. But it's still the same diamond. And we're teaching the same message. But we're viewing it from different angles, therefore we can learn from each other. <clears throat> Messianic Jews are, use the, the Pardis. This is our, our way of learning. We have the Pisat, which is the, the first level. This is the level of, of simple level, the surface level. Then the Ramis is the, the hint level, where, where we're given a little hint of, of what it is. And so we're able to build on the first level. The third level is the Ras, which is, is about uh, exposition or application, applying those first two levels. By the time you get to the third level, you're actually applying it, you know. So a lot of times in Christian, um, say, learning is that you're reading and you're learning as you go and you're learning by those words that are there. And as you're learning by those words that are there, they make sense to you because those words are, are a reality. They're... they're they mean something to you. But in Hebraic teaching, you, you have to go into something a little more, uh, maybe a little deeper. And, and this is where you begin to, to bring a, um, a hint or an allusion as to what you know, th this really means. And then finally, the sword level, the final level, is where we can begin to really know the hidden meaning, the hidden truths, the secrets of God's word. So we, we tend to look at it from those angles. Now, in reality, there is only one way to see and understand the printed word of God. And I think uh, in reality, it would be this. If you were an author and you wrote a book, we would want to, we would presume that uh, we are going to be reading something from the mindset of the person that wrote it, right? And so therefore, it's the same with the word of God because God chose a peculiar people, a people that he would inspire, breathe the, the breath of inspiration on them. And so, there is only one way to see and understand the printed page, and that is from the minds of the people who authored the printed word. And we know that it was God, Hashem, who made the decision. He made the decision to be, uh, to whom the scripture should be written by. And he chose uh, Jewish men, and he breathed on them. He inspired them to pin the scriptures. So he inspired them. The word inspired or inspiration simply means God breathed. If you, if you, if you say, you know, I really feel inspired to, to praise the Lord. Well, that means that you, he just breathed on you. And God breathed on them. He inspired them. It is the inspired word of God. God breathed on them. No one else breathed on them. It was him that breathed on them. And you need to go to the authors that were breathed upon in order to be able to, to really understand the, the printed word of God. Okay, so it's fine and good that you have a good English Bible and, and you love your Bible and you've had it all your life. But how about going over to finding out how the Hebraic mindset was? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So God breathed. Inspiration means the Bible truly is the word of God. The Bible is truly the Word of God, and it makes the Bible unique among all other books. Mm -hmm. The interpretation, uh, let's say, uh, and give you an example of the Constitution of the United States. It's, a, it's an amazing document, right? 
oh, several hundred years old. Now, who wrote that constitution? If you just if you just read it or read it, and you're among people that maybe don't like the constitution, they say, you know, th this this paper is not that good. You know, we have some other ideas. Or maybe you read it for the first time, and you're just reading it. How about going and, and looking into the mindset of the authors, the ones that actually wrote it several hundred years ago? These brilliant men helped shape and form the Constitution and the American way of life. And they, they based it primarily on the Tanakh and the teachings of the Old Testament. They carefully chose all the words after much debate, and the record of these debates is called the Constitutional Convention Records. Yeah. So if you're just reading the Constitution, maybe you should go another step further. If you're just reading the Word of God, maybe you should try to go a little further and see, well, let me see how the Messianics fit into this picture. And now th that the rabbi is telling us that uh, we're supposed to be one, I mean, if we were engrafted, if you were engrafted in, and, and you become part of Israel, you really have to get a little bit more of the breath of Israel. I think it would behoove you because, listen, Israel welcomed you in. Those parents that adopted you welcome you in. They say, we want that, we want her, we want him, we want him, please come. So they loved you, and they received you, and they're nourishing you, clothing you, everything. Learn a little bit more about your adopted parents. Okay? Yes. I think that uh, shouldn't be that hard for us to do. Can we do that, folks? Yes, we can. All right. So what, do, what, does, what does this mean today? Uh, let's say, for example, the Constitution of the United States. It, it, we read that the Constitution was designed to be a living document. So no one can say that it's dead because people are living according to the Constitution of the United States. So in, in effect, that document is like a living document. And someone comes and tries to, to do something uh, that is not there, we have to say, is it in the Constitution? Or else uh, someone comes and knocks on the door where there's a, a, a federal officer, a police officer, and you say, I have my constitutional what? You have your rights. You say, it's like a, the Constitution's alive, and it's keeping me a free man. It's keeping me uh, with the ability to exercise and live and enjoy life as a whole. Indeed. You see, the, the, the inspired word of God that was written and penned by the Jews. And I ask the question, are these Jewish scriptures designed to change with times? Another question, when the Jewish scriptures are, are translated into another language, is the fundamental meaning to evolve with the times and with the other languages? And I would say very clearly the answer is no. Why? Because the initial scriptures and writings are alive. They were inspired. And how can you replace it with some other idea when you have the living word, the inspired word of God? And I hope to show you uh, in this study here tonight that most of the new covenant, the Brachadasha, most of the phrases and, and wording is right out of Jewish thought. 
And it's also right out of Jewish culture because God gave them the, the mindset and he gave them the culture all the way to the kosher food. And every lifestyle that is there is incorporated right into the Torah. Mm -hmm. Right into his word. And if you, if you do not recognize it or you, you, you don't know very much about it, as I said, if you've been adopted into the seed of Abraham, please begin to explore. Do some research. Call somebody. Call your rabbi. Call your pastor. Call those pastors that understand this. So let's begin to, by defining some terminology. First of all, what do we mean by the, by the Jewish or he, Hebrew perspective? Let me begin by giving the simple answer. First of all, when we use the term, we mean uh, the way that, w that the writers of the scriptures looked at life. That's the Hebrew perspective. The way... The writers of the scriptures looked at life. The way they looked at the world that they lived in. And life to come, the life to come in accordance to how God taught them. He said what? I'm going to teach you of my ways. And his ways was not just for them but it is for us too, so that we today may walk in this path. So they were taught, and they learned how to walk in his ways, and so the, 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 the Jewish culture is part of his ways, because he taught them to walk in his ways. And almost from the beginning, Hashem, our God, divides the inhabited world into his way. So there is my way, saith the Lord, and, and then there's man's way, right? So he divides it between his ways and other ways. Psalms 32, verse 8 says, I will instruct you. I will instruct and teach you. So God wants to instruct us. He wants to teach us. He says, in this way. This is important for all Christians because he's saying that he wants to teach you in this way. Please don't forget everything you learned this far, right? He wants to teach you this way that you may, that you are to go. You're supposed to go this way. So the Hebraic way is not like a Jewish kind of a way. It's his way. And he wants to teach you how to go his ways so that you may go so that you may go. And he says, listen to the last part of it. I will give you counsel on this. I'm going to give you understanding so that you can make your way through because you've been adopted and you don't know this way. You've been out there like a wild, uh, what? A branch? A wild olive, you know? But now you come into the trunk of the olive tree not, not just into a branch. You, you, you come right into the tree itself. And all of the sap and the rich sap of that tree is, is available to you. This is why he will give you counsel. I will teach you of my ways. And then the last part is that I will give you, it says, and my eyes will be watching you. Oh, wow. Not only is he going to help you and guide you and, and teach you his ways and give you counsel, but he's going to be watching to see if you are accepting your new heritage because you've been brought into Israel. You remember the first part of this teaching. You maintain your ethnicity. You are still whom you were born but you've been adopted now. What would happen if you were not adopted? Do you want to get disadopted? I don't know. I don't think so. 
You've been adopted. I think that you need to stay adopted because you've been adopted into the branch. Okay. So, folks, the, the Jewish people, they, they get or they got their teachings directly from Hashem. He was their teacher. Remember just everything we read there in Psalm 32, 8? He was their teacher. He was their uh, everything. He supplied all their needs. And he separates good from evil, right from wrong, holy from unholy, clean from that which is unclean. Don't forget that. I just mentioned they keep separating these things. He wanted his people like he wants all of us here today to not simply talk the talk, but to also begin to walk the walk. That's why he says, I'm going to be watching you to see if you're walking the walk. Are you walking the walk? What about the talk? Mm -hmm. are, are you talking about how glad you are that you've been engrafted? You know, do you ever talk to anyone about your engraftedness? I don't think so. I, I, I don't hear Christians talking about, you know, Rabbi, I'm so happy that I was adopted, you know. <laughs> you and I are one. We're family. We're Ohana, Mishpaha. Yeah. So he separates all of this, holy and holy, unclean from unclean. He wants us not to simply talk, but to what? Uh, but to walk the walk. And what? So Hashem, our God, he told Adam and, and Eve, Chava's her name, um, Hava or Eva. And where are we right now? In Eva. Mm, so. <laughs> uh -huh. so. So he spoke to Eva because in the future there will be life. There will be many people that will be in Eva. Mm -hmm. And he spoke to them from the very beginning. And he told them exactly what to eat and what not to eat. Do not eat from this tree. Do not eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. So he's still speaking, especially to Eva he was speaking to. And he put a difference between his ways and another way. He instructed Adam as to what sacrifice to bring and what not to bring. And Adam told his sons, listen, logically, Logical assumption if he had added, um, for example, Hebrews 11, 4. Adam said to his sons, Hashem, God commands. Noah was told which animals were clean and which were not clean. This is important. And we're going to get to the reason why. In Ezekiel 22, 6, her priests have done violence, says the word, to my law, and have profaned my holy things. They have made no distinction between the holy and that which is profane. And they have not taught, listen, they have not taught the difference between the unclean and the clean. And they hide their face from my Sabbath. Do you see that? Why? Are they hiding their face from the Sabbath? Because they are involved with something that is, is not kosher, is not clean. And what could that be? That could, could it be different interpretations of the Word of God? That the Word of God has been interpreted to, to serve a purpose? To serve Man, that he's, he said, we don't need the Hebrew Bible. Let, let's make our own. After all, you know, uh, 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 we are ethnic. And let's make something that serves our uh, uh, ethnicity. Uh, 
And this is why we, we began with, the, with, with understanding that from the very beginning, God, God was separating that which is clean and that which is not clean. At least not clean for, for people that walk with God to touch or to eat that. Ezekiel 22, 6. He says again, and they hide their eyes from my Sabbath. And he says, and I am profaned among them. Wow. Ezekiel 44, 23. Moreover, they shall teach my people the difference between the holy and the profane and cause them to discern between the clean and the unclean. Now I want to stop here and now and I want to ask a question. Do you know what is clean and unclean for you? For you? Because if something is is clean for you, but it's not clean for your other brother near you, God says don't eat it in front of him because it's unclean to that person. And if, if, if something that you're going to drink is, is unclean for the other person, don't drink it in front of that person. So I ask the question, do you know what's clean or unclean for you? We don't stop and think about that. Mm -hmm. What about, do you know what's good for your children to watch in TV and what is not good for them to watch? Do you know if it's good to put all these gadgets in your children's hands? This is part of knowing what's clean and what's unclean. Because we cannot approach God with unclean hands. And if we've been, we've been studying stuff, this is where the false prophets come in because they're so unclean. And they make up their own rules about what they want to do and how they approach it. They, most of the time they come behind closed doors. They never get the okay from a pastor or a rabbi. They're after the sheep. Mm -hmm. and, and so these, ra these uh, uh, prophets are unclean. And you don't want them unclean in your church or your synagogue. I think I mentioned before that I had three, three of them come to my synagogue, and by the time they, they left, at least one of them was so repentant. I'm not going to prophesy again. No. Oh, hallelujah. Do you know which prophet out there you've been listening to is clean or unclean? And how do you know that he's clean or unclean if you don't know and you haven't studied enough about what a false prophet is and how they operate? He chooses Abraham, Hashem, from a, everyone else to be the father of, of countless people countless nations. He chooses Sarah and Rebecca, Leah to be the mother of countless nations. Why? Why would he choose them? And why would he choose you? Why would he choose them? The answer is clear. They walked the walk and they talked the talk. And if you walk the walk and you talk the talk, then he will choose you. He'll give you a great assignment. Not only that, but he'll open uh, areas of ministry in your life that you never imagined are possible. Truly he will. And we're not here and you're not here because you made the decision to come. You're not a minister because you decided. No, we're here because uh, he chose us. You're here because like Abraham and Sarah, he chose you from among all the other people. 
Aren't you glad that he chose you? And what did he choose you, Christians? He chose you to engraft you. You see, he chose you to engraft you. Not just to be a Christian. No, because you're supposed to be a one new man with the Jews, the Messianic Christian, believing Jews. That's how he chose you. So I ask the question, do you know how clean or unclean you are? Or are you not part of a family and you don't want to be with that family? That, that would be considered unclean. Or would you consider the, the Messianic Jews to be the unclean ones because you don't want to connect with them? Look at the amazing scripture of Bereshit, Genesis 12, verses 1 to 3. For this is the same way that he called you into Torah. Listen, now. Now, Hashem said to Abraham, get yourself out of your country, away from your kinsmen, away from your family, and away from your father's house, and go to the land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you, and I will make your name great. And you are to be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. But I will curse anyone who curses you. And by you all the families of the earth will be blessed. <clears throat> Do you know Christians. That you've been brought into a family. Where you are now part of blessing all the families of the earth. Because you've been adopted. You, 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 you've been brought in. You're not an outsider any longer. What this means is he is revealing that everyone who clings to Abraham's ways will be blessed. He disseminates his word through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and he continues to use his language to reveal his precious words. He reveals a difference, the difference between Isaac and Ishmael. From this point forward, there's a revelation there. He divides the world into Israel and the nation. So right now what we have here is we have Israel and the nations. And I'm not talking about the Israel over there I'm talking about you and I are Israel. So he divides Israel and the nations. Are you in or are you out? If you are Israel, you're adopted, we are one. So he divides the world into Israel and what? The nations of the world. His ways are Israel's ways. And then there's a, the ways of the nation. His ways are and all other ways. There's a way that seems right unto man. That's not God's ways. There's only Israel's ways. He reveals a difference again, all right? And I paused again because I paused before, and I will pause at least one more time. This is my third pause, or the second pause. And I pause to ask you, are you there yet? Are you there yet? Or are you still outside? But, but you can't be outside. Listen, uh, hey, it's uh, 11 o'clock. Come home. Come home. Where? Israel. That's, we're one. One new man. Okay? So are you in yet? Have you... As a serious student of God's word, a minister, a teacher, are you, as a serious Torah student, divided? Divided away from the ways of this world? In scripture, the ways of the nations are always contrasted, 
to the ways of God. Paul mentions several times, actually, that there is male and female, slave and free. There is then Judah and, and there's nations. Paul several times mentions that. So there's Israel, there's Judah, and then there's nations. And why is this? Because the nations look at and they delve into all aspects of life. They don't stop to, to, to weigh, is this good for me? Is this good for my family? Is this good for our future? So all kinds of ways of life are, seems to be acceptable. The world we live in, folks, and, and, and are the ways, not the ways of God, necessarily. I want us to look at this uh, undisputable word from Romans chapter 9. The people of Israel, 4 and 5, the people of Israel, they were made God's children. So the people of Israel were made what? God's children. Now we know that in, in the Tanakh and the Old Testament, but now we bring it into the New Testament to, so that every believing Christian will know that the Jewish people were actually made God's children. And the so what, what is theirs as God's children? Because if you've been engrafted, what's theirs is yours. So they were made God's children, and it says that the Shekinah has been with them. The covenants are theirs. Likewise, the giving of the Torah is theirs. The temple services and the promises are theirs. The patriots, the patriots, are theirs. And from them, as far as his physical descent is concerned, came the Messiah. It came from them. Theirs is all of this, and then Messiah comes from them, who is over all. Praise be Adonai forever. Amen. Okay, so maybe this is getting to be too much for you, but I, I, I'm sorry, but this is your heritage. This is your roots. This is where you've been engrafted into. Mm -hmm. So you might stop and ask yourself, why is a... Why is 90% of the scriptures written by Hebrews? <clears throat> so much Hebrews in the scripture. And why did God chose to take upon the flesh of the Hebrews? He didn't take the flesh of another nationality, but he took the flesh of the Hebrews. And why did Yeshua observe, why did he observe only Hebrew feasts? And he didn't observe no other feast. Is he our model? Is he our an example? Do you say, I only do what Yeshua does? And what man created and all of these laws, I don't want anything to do with them. What about if man created holidays that he did not create? Okay, well, that's different because we get gifts. Okay, so you're interested in gifts. Why did he observe only Hebrew feasts? He didn't, you know, there were many feasts going around, Roman feasts, pagan feasts, Phoenician feasts, all feasts all over, the, all over the place, but he only observed Hebrew feasts. They're called the feasts of the Lord because he came up with those feasts. You see? And he knew what the world needed and the world needed and when you were engrafted in, you became part of partaking in all of his feast. That's why I asked the question and let me rephrase it. Have you been participating in that which is clean? His feasts are clean. 
because they're his feast. Why did the gospel go to the Jews, the Jewish people first, and then to the Greeks? <clears throat> Romans 1.16. <clears throat> Why did it not go to the Greeks first? Maybe the Gentiles first. Why did it go to the Jews first? Why was the disciples to replace Judah's, Judah with another Hebrew? Why was the apostles to, to the Gentiles uh, a Hebrew? Could it be that the Hebrew people spoke his language, celebrated his feast? Yeah, they did. They knew his commands. They were familiar with his covenants and his ways. And when we talk about seeing the scriptures from a, a Hebraic perspective again, or a Hebraic mindset, we're talking about the ways of God already clearly defined in his word, in his Torah. But virtually, it is ignored by the Western world. I find it interesting that every president seems to do a Hanukkah. That's all they do, the Hanukkah. But it's because they want the what vote? They want the Jewish vote? Yeah. The necessity of knowing how the New Testament writers looked at life and the various idioms uh, and, and precious uh, and phrases and so forth and so on it's important because the idioms that, are, were, that we receive from the word, we, we say a lot of idioms ourselves here, but they are there for a particular reason. Maybe I won't have enough time to, to actually get into the idiom part, but I think that we, we, want, we want you to know that Psalms 32.8 says, I will instruct and teach you in this way, so that you, are, which way? The way that you are to go, and we, we, we read that a while ago, but I want to just bring that up again because the culture of the writers of the new covenant is just like this through, under, through understanding Hebraic perspective of the scriptures as being taught by, by the, a Jewish person or by Yeshua himself and the disciples. He is saying, I will teach you of his ways. In other words, we also now must teach of his ways. Why? So that we today will walk in his path. If we could somehow separate uh, the kind of Jewishness idea and just embrace the Hebraic idea that, that God gave his people, I think that we together can, can have a good dialogue and we can not only learn together, but we can really be a family in God. Would you say amen? amen? Hallelujah. Well, I hope that this study has been really um, motivating you to take that step and, and to know that you can do this. Say, I can do this. I can do this. All right. Thank you so much for your undivided attention. And... And please, uh, if you want these studies, you can contact us through, um, right there through the live stream that you ha you're watching right now, and they'll put you in contact with me, and I'll send these messages directly to you. Let us stand together. Hallelujah. Our most awesome and great God, you are our Father. And you are the one that made us one in the Spirit and one in the Lord. And I think this message in these days are relevant because, God, what you're about to do is so huge that you need us to be one. 
one in the Lord, one in the Spirit, one in Messiah. And I ask you, God, that you may touch your people, both those that are Jewish that do not know you, bring them into the knowledge of the salvation of Messiah in our day, in our time. And those of us that have come to know the Messiah, that have Jewish heritage, we, we so desire to work together with the Christians, Lord. Those that have been engrafted in, because I know that we are a family, and we belong together. We must work together. We must build your kingdom together. This is not our kingdom, it's your kingdom. You established it, Lord. And I pray, God, that you will send a mighty unction upon both the Jews and Christians in, the, in this day and this hour. And we'll see the greatest coming together ever. Not only are we in Eva, Lord, but we are in this island that's called the gathering place. And why would we be in a gathering place if it isn't that you want to gather us together from every ethnic group, from all walks of life? Uh, I pray right now that you would bring down those walls, Lord, of separation. Uh, walls, Lord, that has held us back from embracing our, our true heritage of being one together with you. And those, Lord, that want to release them and show them exactly how. And, and Lord, just if there's someone that has not accepted Messiah, I ask you now to touch that heart and bring them into the saving knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Messiah Yeshua. And someone that might be sick in body right now, heal, I pray. Loose your mighty power upon them from the crown of their head to the soles of their feet. Someone that's been going through depression or been oppressed, lift up that oppression right now. I call for that oppression to, to leave you right now. Hallelujah. And, and let it rise out of you right now that you would know that it happened in this instant and this moment uh, that we have prayed and agreed with you in faith. Uh, so be it now. And I declare it and so shall it be. Amen. 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 Hallelujah.